Good day, poker peeps. This is Sky with Smart Poker Study, and I have a question for you. Would you bluff check raise these hands? We're going to go through two hands right now where I had the opportunity to bluff check raise. Discuss those hands, what we had going for us, why you would want to check raise bluff these hands. And then after we go through the two, I'll get into some bluff check raising strategies down here. First off, the very first thing, if you ever consider a bluff, whether it's a check raise bluff, a c-bet bluff, a donk bluff, an all-in on the river bluff, a three-bet shove pre-flop bluff, anything, you have to ask yourself, can they find a fold? Now, pre-flop, they can probably find a fold if they just have a really wide range and it's just too many chips to even think about putting in with their 10-7 suited, an ace-5 offsuit, things like that. Post-flop, like we're discussing here with check raising, you want to think about your opponent's ranges. Can they have high card hands that are folding? If it's a seven high board, can they fold their ace high, king high, queen high, jack high, ten high hands? If so, great. That's a really good indicator that your check raise bluff is going to work. Also, do they have potentially weak pairs that can fold? Maybe they're an honest player on the flop. This player right over here, folding 100% of the time, granted, this is ignition poker, so the hands are just from this table session sitting down, 13 hands, he's folded one out of one, but just imagine if somebody who has folded 100, maybe 90, maybe even 80% of the time, out of 10 opportunities, out of 20 opportunities, they can easily find a fold, right? These players uh, can fold with their weak pairs. Also, on maybe dry boards, when there's no draws, Maybe not no draws, but very few draws possible and no really strong draws. Awesome. Those are good indicators that your opponent can find a fold. So we have our first hand, the four deuce suited. Let's check out the action. Limper, limper, fold, limper, limper. Holy cow. So first off, before we get to anything else, this is one of the reasons why I play on Ignition Poker. You can see I have all these players color coded green. They are all fish. Now, right now, I only have two hands on this player. 18 hands here. But in the next hand that we go through, you're going to see how fishy this player and this player are. That's why they're color coded green right now. But anyway, all those limps across the board, right? Five players to the flop, out of position against three of them, multi way, flop comes down 3 5 queen, giving us an open ended straight draw as well as a backdoor flush draw right here. No pair power, but we have some good draws, some equity, right? So check, I check 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 and finally a bet of probably what is exactly half pot if we take out a couple chips for uh the rake we get a caller and then now this is my question to you would you check raise bluff and if the answer is yes how much would you make it pause the video if you want a little time to think about it just imagine if you just made a min raise to 4.8 is that going to get these two players that already put 2.4 in to fold no 4.8, way too little. But what if you made it 20 big blinds? Yeah, that should get everybody to fold unless they have a really strong hand. You make their decision a little bit too easy at 20 big blinds. So I made it 12 big blinds right here. I kind of figured, well, at the time before I made it, the pot was already roughly 10 big blinds. I went basically one uh, bet greater than that. Made it 12 right here. I felt that this is definitely enough pressure. If they have nothing, a pair of threes, maybe a pair of fives, like five, seven, without any clubs or anything, I think this kind of bet could get both of these players to fold. And they all folded right here. So let's go back to this decision. Before I made it 12 big blinds, what do we have going for us? Well, first off, this is not a very wet board. The two clubs work together. The three and the five work together. Obviously, we've got the open ender here, right? But the three and the queen don't work, nor does the five and the queen right here. So it's not the wettest of boards, semi-dry or semi-wet kind of board, I, we could say. Now, because we just checked out of the big blind, we can literally rep pocket threes, pocket fives, and any top pair hand. Queen 10, queen jack, queen nine. We might even have queen five or queen three for two pair hands right here. Now, given that everybody else limped, sure, random queens are in their ranges too. Pocket fives and pocket threes are in their limping range as well. So maybe everybody can rep a really strong hand right here. But we do have that on our side going for us. Now, this one caller, 
He's absolutely showing weakness. He doesn't like to fold on flops. Zero out of two opportunities. Just calling, not check raising himself, which is what somebody with a set or even a two pair hand, three, five, queen, five, who completed out of the small blind, they might be check raising with those. And this is also just a simple half pot bet right here. Often just a standard bluff sizing. I don't read any strength into this bet. Now, this player has C-bet 100% of the time. It is only one out of one. If this were a greater sample, I mean, I love seeing that percentage. It means that he's possibly capable of bluffing. But if this were a really high percentage over a greater sample, 10, 20 opportunities, definitely indicative of a C-bet bluffer. This could easily be a C-bet bluff in the best position. Just half pot has C-bet one time in the past. Also, an interesting idea here. Everybody, because it's a limped pot, everyone has just invested one big blind. They all have big stacks, as you can see, uh, 94, oh, he's not even in the hand, but 99 and 75 big blinds. Nobody is committed to that five big blind pot, not just yet. Also, we have equity outs to barrel on. Equity outs are cards that can come on the next street to either make your hand or give you a better draw. An ace or a six gives us a straight and a a spade gives us a backdoor flush draw. Lots of different cards that can come out that we can barrel, uh, put more pressure on our opponents, whoever does decide to call us. So, obviously, we bet and take it down. A nice little pickup right here with a simple bluff without a made hand. So let's go on to the next hand right here. Five, four, offsuit. I'm going to ask you once again, would you check raise bluff? And if so, how much? So let's continue. We got a limper, a limper, a limper, a limper. Like I said, it's so great playing ignition. Limpers up the wazoo on this table or in these games, right? The flop comes down, do six, seven. We flop the open ender. Check, check, check. Tiny bet, tiny call, tiny call. Our option right here. So let me ask you, would you check raise bluff? And if so, how much? And if you need, pause the video to give yourself some room to think. So for me, this is what I did. I failed to check raise bluff and I really am disappointed in myself afterwards as I was reviewing hands, I caught this one. This is a great opportunity to check raise bluff and let's talk about what we have going for us in relation to this hand up here. Not a very wet board. Once again, no flush draws possible, some straight draws possible. We got one of them, of course. We can, once again, rep some very strong hands. It's a limped pot. We just checked in the big blind. We've got deuces, sixes, sevens, seven, six. We might even have seven deuce and six deuce offsuit because we just checked our option right here. We might even have like pocket eights, right, that we just checked. We didn't want to bloat the pot pre-flop. Now, this is even better. In that last hand, we saw the player on the button bet half pot. This is even weaker than that. 1.5 big blinds into the five big blind pot, and a call equals weakness. Another call equals plenty of weakness. There's a good chance if either of these players had hit a strong hand, they could have been raising on their own because they just want to win an entire stack right here. He's got 58 big blinds behind. They both have him covered. If they had a set of sevens or a set of sixes, they should be raising for value here. Potentially, or maybe just calling because it is such a small bet, but just in general, fishy players calling a small bet equals weakness. Oh, once again, two callers, weakness. Now, once again, just like in the prior one, everyone only invested one big blind. We have relatively big stacks. This guy only has 58. He's got 47 right there. So that's basically a nine to one stack to pot ratio. It's not as big as everyone having 100 big blinds, but still, there's a very good chance he is not committed with any pair, nor is this player is probably just bluffing with two over cards right now. Lastly, and this might have been the reason why I didn't check raise in this one, it's that we didn't have a backdoor flush draw. We didn't have an additional draw, nor a pair. If this would have been four, six, seven, or maybe a couple of diamonds with that one diamond right there, I may have pulled the trigger on it. Um, we basically just have a straight draw. A three or an eight gives us a straight right here. I guess you could say we also have backdoor straight draw, like an ace comes and then a three, but basically, I'm just thinking about my straight draw right now. But I really wish I had a um, uh, 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 check raised bluff. Now, if I would have done it, I would have probably used the same size as that prior hand. 
9.5 big blinds right now. I would have probably made it 12 once again, really selling the idea that I have the deuces, the sixes, the seven, the seven, six, two pair kind of hand. And I really think it would have worked on this one. All right, so let's talk about check raise bluffing strategies. In general, you want to check raise bluff when your hand is just not strong enough to check call right here. Now, if you think mathematically, I have the open ender, which is eight outs to a straight times two is 16%. Mathematically, I'm getting the odds to call right now. But then I open myself up to maybe a check raise from this player. I also open myself up to not hitting and then just check folding versus a bigger bet on the next street when an over card like an ace, a king, a queen kind of hit. So I'm not a big fan of check calling, like I said, even though I'm mathematically getting the right price to call. If we take a look at this other hand, Let's take a look at the math involved real quick. So I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but given just that I have to call 2.4 to try to win a total pot right now of 9.8, I need 20% equity with my straight draw. That's four, I'm sorry, eight outs once again. A backdoor draw is one outs, that's nine outs total, times two is 18%. I'm just barely mathematically not making a good call if I call right here. But in both instances, once again, I just really don't want to call on any non-ace, non-six. I'm just going to probably check fold on the next street. You want to check raise bluff when you know that they can find a fold, like we discussed already. But also, you just want to end the hand right now. It's not like I have a top pair hand. It's not like I flopped a set. I'm not trying to get them to fold if I flop a set of threes here. I would probably check raise a little bit smaller to get value out of these players in this spot. So if you want the hand to end and you're not strong enough to check call, check raise bluffing is a good strategy. Now, you need to know that he can find a fold. Target hard to hit boards, kind of what we have here. Here, once again, a hard to hit board. It hits your range and not his. Now, that's where these two hands kind of differ because it's a limped pot all around. Everybody has a small pocket pairs. But in general, just imagine we had called with 4-5 offsuit. He raised preflop. He has all the big cards in his range that completely whiffed on a flop like this. Also, a great thing, look for those small bet sizes, like this one right here, 1.5 and a call and a call. Everyone is just displaying absolute weakness right now. Or if you just suspect weakness based on their sizing and maybe the sizing they made it in the past. Also, when it comes to Stack sizes, like I said, you want to pay attention to stack sizes. If this player that bet for some weird thing, maybe this is a tournament hand, right? And he only had eight big blinds behind, and there's 9.5 in the pot right now, there's no way a check raise is going to get him to fold. But because his stack to pot ratio is so high, no one's committed, they can find the fold. Now, you also want to look for uh, frequent C betters. Now, none of these players make a ton of frequent, oh, 100% right here. It's only one out of one. But if they C bet the flop a lot over a big sample size, that means they bluff a lot. They're not going to like facing your check raise unless they actually happen to have a strong hand at the time. If they're a bluffer, they might be a folder. And I said maybe because some players are sticky. They put in a half pot on the flop. They are not going to fold with any kind of draw because they committed chips. They do not want you to bluff them so easily. Now, what also helps and why we discussed equity outs right here, equity outs to barrel on in case you get called is a great thing. If I check raised at this opportunity, we had the three or the eight. Remember on that prior hand, we had way more equity outs. And like I said, that might've been the deciding factor at the time when I made this. Um, when you have a draw, flush draw, straight draw, or over cards, there's one card that can come bam on the next street to turn your bluffing spot into now a value betting spot. Draws are great to be check raise bluffing on. Backdoor draws are good too, because let's imagine we had all folds, but one player decided to call. The turn comes a spade. Let's just imagine the seven of spades right here. I can barrel on that. Now that I have a flush draw, I have an 18% chance to now hit a strong hand on the river. 
I know it's only a four high flush draw, but still, it doesn't often happen when you get flush over flush, especially in a back door opportunity right here. I would barrel on that other spade to put additional pressure on this opponent. Imagine he called right now. There'd be another 10 big blinds in the pot. We'd be up to 30, uh, 32 big blinds. I still have 95. He still has 127. It's still possible there's room to maneuver to get this player to fold with a turn double barrel. Now, what's also good is a pair plus one of these draws, whether it's a straight up one card draw or a backdoor draw. Let's take a look at this other hand one more time. So just imagine right here, that was a four instead of a six, seven. We would have a pair plus the open ender. A five on the turn would give us two pair. The ugly thing is it would put four, five, six, seven, but at least we improved with a little bit greater showdown strength. We can be any random seven, any random six right now once that five hits. Now, also another four. Remember, four, six, seven with the four. We now have trips. We're crushing any random seven, any random six, any pocket eights, um, uh, any nines that might have limped in as well, right? So there's some really good cards that can come when you have a pair plus some kind of a draw. All right, thank you for watching the video. Please write these down on a sticky note. The next time you get into a flop opportunity or a flop check raise bluffing opportunity, look at this lift list. If a lot of these things are in your favor, go ahead and test out, oh, especially if you got those equity outs to barrel on, go ahead and test out check raise bluffing at different sizes. The only way you're gonna develop this as a strategy in your arsenal to win more post-flop pots is by experimenting with it.